um, from falls. So, so, so then, so that, that, that is where we are today. So, how do we repair that trust in the institutions then, Jim? Or Ermer, you go. I just want to go back to the issue of transparency. I want to issue of I still believe that there are some very good people out there who still believe in what we are about and who want to take a look at the facts as they present it and then give them an opportunity. They don't always have the mic, but give them opportunity to to provide sane analysis and perhaps provide some sane conclusion. Bar was never going to be, uh, um, how do you say that, uh, uh, an unbiased um, provider of information. He told you who he was before he was even appointed. And so he told you what his position was before he was even appointed. That sort of kicked him, from, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not, I am not surprised about the outcome. What I'm sad about is that our entire um, media apparatus has been trapped by this conversation in a loop. And there's been no real, um, you know, questioning mm -hmm. of both sides. I think you have to question, I'm a Democrat, but you have to question Democrats and you have to question Republicans. You have to, qu all of us have to be questioned in this work um, that is supposed to be about our country. It's not partisan, it's about the country and let's get back to that. Last word on this before we move to the next topic, Jim. Uh, I think the separation of powers sets us free. I think that the separation of legislative, executive, and judicial power, as well as the federal, state, local, keeps people who are really ambitious, want to do really bad things from being able to do that and gives us an opportunity to make things public and making it public. Uh, and I think courageously looking at every inch of what just happened would be good for us. Mm -hmm. Well, talking about the separation of federal and local, <laughs> let's let's talk about uh, Suffolk District Attorney Rachel Rollins, uh, because she's making yeah. an effort here to make good on some of her campaign promises. She put out a policy memo this week, and she outlined her vision for progressive prosecution, saying she wants members of her staff to inform her if they see immigration agents in the courts where they are working. A lot of the cases that we have depend on victims and witnesses being willing to cooperate with us, and that includes immigrants. And if there's a fear of arrest or deportation that drives them away, we lose their health and we lose our cases. And she also says that her office will dismiss low-level nonviolent offenses or resolve them without jail time. I don't believe that people should be branded for the rest of their lives based on these low-level, non-serious crimes that often are the result of mental illness, substance use disorder, and poverty. But Governor Charlie Baker worries that these policies won't do enough to protect the victims of crime. Victims are owed a criminal justice system that takes their in interests and their issues as seriously as everybody else's. So let's start with the uh, policy on immigration and customs enforcement ICE officers in courtrooms. Uh, Jim, what do, what do you make of that of that new policy? Look, I think it's a it's sort of a uh, you've got competing interests here. You want to make sure that witnesses show up. You want to make sure that they feel like they're not going to be carted off. And to do that, she's making her case that um, ICE should be uh, notifying her. You know, it's, it's interesting, in interviews, she's mentioned that the um, regional head of ICE has notifies every other uh, chief of police but doesn't notify her. So it seems to be... Todd Lyons. Yeah, Todd Lyons. It seems to be something, there's, there's competing interests. On the other side, there's a spat. And two grown-ups have to actually sit in a room and figure out the spat because this is not a good situation for folks. And I mean, there, there are lots of reasons why I see what Governor Baker's seen, but also you want to make sure that as a DA, look... Uh, D.A. Rollins is a very serious person. She herself, in talking about this, says that, look, people have a right to be nervous about what I mean. She's trying some new things. Um, I think she's open to listening. She's open to reach. She'll talk to anybody about this stuff. And I think we have to track it really closely as she tries to implement it. But the other part of it, these two grown-ups, the head of ICE mm -hmm. and the D.A., need to sit down in a room and figure it out. <laughs> They're welcome here on Radio Boston any day. Uh, Marie St. Floor. I, I mean, I agree. I, I agree with that analysis. I, I, I think that what, she, what she's asked is her staff to inform her. Since the ICE has not elected to inform her, as she's indicated, they've informed everyone else in terms of the chief of police. She is a law enforcement officer. She has, um, she has staff that is operating in those courtrooms that are directly impacted by the actions of ICE. I think that as a matter of course of um, professional courtesy and respect, it would seem to me obvious if you're going to call one law enforcement officer, you'd also call the other. So since that is not occurring, she has asked that her staff inform her when they show up. I think that is a, I think that is a fair uh, ask for, a, for an executive to ask of their staff. I don't think that's appropriate. 
So in a statement to multiple news outlets, Todd Lyons, as we mentioned, the acting field office director for ICE here in Boston, uh, said that attempts to promote an overall fear or suspicion of law enforcement officers is counterproductive, counterproductive and very misguided. And I'm just wondering, at the same time, isn't it the DA's job to prosecute and investigate crimes with law enforcement? So again, sitting down and working with ICE, getting together, isn't that kind of part of her job? It, it is, but it, I think it goes both ways. Look, this is not a place where, you know, the, the feds get to just jump in and say, we define all the terms of the debate. That's not how it works. This is a, again, a separated hierarchy of, of, um, of power. Uh, and so I think if he's saying don't uh, besmirch us, don't say we're trying to do something bad, don't put fear into people's heads, he has to sit down with her and work this stuff mm -hmm. out as well. It goes both ways. So let's talk about uh, her now codified do not prosecute list. Uh, she says it's part of her vision for progressive prosecution, as we mentioned. It includes things like drug offenses, shoplifting, destruction of property, and she says it's about keeping people out of the criminal justice system in the first place. This is... I want these people out of the criminal justice system so they can get the help that they actually need because we're the catch basin at the end of many, many societal failures in these individuals' lives. But Governor Baker, as we heard at the top there, has concerns about this vision of progressive prosecution. Uh, Marie, what do you make of this? Well, I, it's so interesting how we've, we've ter ter we have criminalized a number of things that probably 30, 40 years ago we would not have criminalized. And as a result of that criminalization, just, we have actually embedded some real um, structural disparities and and who's impacted and who's not impacted. And so if you, what the, some of the things that I saw are drug offenses, well, today we're saying don't prosecute folks who are opioid addicted. Why is that? We've had people who've been addicted for, for decades, but today the, the, the complexion and, and the um, income status mm -hmm. of many of the folks who are addicted and are, is changing. And so now we can connect with those folks and we say, well, these are human beings. Um, they need to be assisted. They need to be supported. We need to figure out how we provide some, some, some sort of um, support for them. But before that, I mean, we had kids who were dying in Boston, whether it was in South Boston and Roxbury for decades, well, of all sorts of overdose, whether it's heroin, what have you. But we were locking those kids up. When we lock those kids up, it's not simply that individual. You have turned their lives um, upside down. Because are you saying we were locking them up because we, they were black we, and brown kids? We, we, we were locking them up. It's income and it's also black and brown. I would, I would suggest that, that if we look at how things have happened overwhelmingly, it has been um, black and brown, but it also has been an impact. The disparity has also occurred because of income. Because if I could afford it, I would be, I would be able, my parents would be able to send me into treatment. And if for those who couldn't afford it, in many instances, Suffolk County House of Correction was the treatment that they were going to get. And that's the unfairness of that. And I think for her to challenge that system is absolutely correct because we criminal, we made those things a criminal act. And if there are alternative ways of being able to, to make certain that that person is rehabilitated rather than locking them up, giving them a, um, a record that they can never sometimes overcome. Mm -hmm. It impacts their ability to go to school. It impacts their ability to get a job, which means that we've shut them out of the opportunity for economic success in this state and in this country. So if there are alternative ways, we should be exploring it because we should really be about rehabilitation and not simply about figuring out ways to lock people up more. But but Jim, how do you balance what Governor Baker mentioned, which, which is uh, protecting the victims of some of these crimes, shoplifting, breaking and entering, malicious destruction of property? No, it's, look, uh, just on, on what Marie was saying, she's absolutely right. We go through cycles. This is what we yeah. do uh, in law enforcement thinking and in any kind of policy thinking. So I guess he, here's what I'd say to that, Jamie. Um, uh, D.A. Rollins is trying to do something really hard, which may not actually even make logical sense. And I, and I respect her a ton, but l mm. let me let me put it this okay. way. Um, she has a 65-page memo that's trying to codify discretion. The word discretion means good judgment in a particular situation. When you codify it, you make a general rule. When you make a general rule, you're essentially regulating it. And, and once you do that, you change how people perceive the action they might undertake. So there is a worry about this. And I think... Look, I would take it a little more slowly and test things out, watch the empirical data, see how it works. Uh, I, I would not go wholesale into all 15 decriminalized um, 
actions that she has done. I would, I would wish that she would rethink some of this. But uh, look, the pendulum does swing the other way when people kind of say, hey, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 70s... Just taking a claim far out, maybe. And, yeah, yeah, broken windows, that may not have worked all sure. together well. And, you know, criminalizing people to the place where we've actually mass, gone into mass incarceration, that may not be working very well. Mm -hmm. I get that. Got it. So... Man, we didn't even get to rent control or all the other things <laughs> we wanted to talk about in, in Week in Review. But I do want to get to our hubbubs, those oh my God. little stories or events that caught her attention. I know. Bad with it's, this a hubbub business. it's a turd. Do you have one, Marie? No? One. All right. Marie, <laughs> Marie's I, taking a mulligan on, yeah, on the yeah, hubbub. Mulligan okay. On the hub. Well, Jim, what's your I'll, hubbub? I'll do one in honor of D.A. Rollins okay. uh, her memo. So, and, and, and Mark Twain would have loved this. Uh, it's coming from Elmira, New York, a center of Twain studies. A middle-aged man stole a Little Debbie Cakes delivery truck while it was being loaded with product. We are talking banana marshmallow cream pies. We're talking fudged dipped strawberry cakes, cookies and cream cakes, fudged dipped banana rolls, red velvet cakes, pecan, pecan, mm. spin wheels, zebra cake, oatmeal cream pie. He stole the vehicle, he said, because he had to go visit his family. Now, get this, he did not eat any of the cakes. Number two, his family didn't get any of the cakes. He's either very honest or he's very cheap. <laughs> Well, and and, and D.A. Rollins wouldn't lock him up. <laughs> That's uh, exactly. not lock him up. <laughs> um, so, so my hubbub, uh, really quickly here, is about a conversation that we had on the show yesterday with Eileen McNamara about proposed cuts to the Special Olympics and the mm. Department of Education budget. Uh, now, McNamara is an expert on Eunice Kennedy Shriver. She's the Kennedy sister who founded the Special Olympics. And, and so here's what uh, McNamara told us at the beginning of our show yesterday. Her spirit is hanging over the Capitol right this moment, and it is enraged. You do not want to be in the path of Eunice Kennedy Shriver when she was enraged. So apparently she was enraged yesterday because just about an hour after McNamara told us that, President Trump said this on the White House lawn. I've been to the Special Olympics. I think it's incredible. And I just authorized a funding. I heard about it this morning. I have uh, overridden my people. We're funding the Special Olympics. So I'm not saying it was a ghost, but maybe. <laughs> yeah. so, Ask Market Basket. Yeah. <laughs> There's a story this Are week we of a ghost at Market Basket. <laughs> There's your hubbub, Marie. Well, that's, <laughs> that's Marie St. Floor. She's a former Massachusetts state rep and now a principal at St. Floor Communications. And Jim Sturgis, executive director of the Pioneer Institute. Thank you to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you coming guys. in. Stick with us, listeners. Coming up, is there a precedent for breaking up major tech companies like Amazon, Facebook, and Google? We'll find out from a historian. I'm Jamie Bologna, and this is Radio Boston. Welcome to WBUR City Space at the Levine Broadcast Center. Please take your seats. The program is about to begin. This is 90.9 WBUR. Coming up at 4 o'clock on All Things Considered, a new poll suggests most Americans think the entire Mueller report should be released. Also, you will get the latest on Brexit. That and much more on All Things Considered at 4 here on 90.9 WBUR. We're funded by you, our listeners, and by New Oz Healthcare, delivering AI-powered speech recognition services for clinical documentation and decision support. Nuance.com. Nuance, the power of you, multiplied. Summer at Tufts University. Courses for students of all ages, from engineering to studio art to languages and nutrition. Online and on campus. Summer.tufts.edu. And Live Nation, presenting Andrew Bird with Calexico and Iron and Wine on Saturday, September 21st at Rockland Trust Bank Pavilion. Tickets available at LiveNation.com. Welcome back to Radio Boston. I'm Jamie Bologna. We're going to talk now about Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren's proposal to break up big temp tech companies if she's elected president in 2020. Here's Warren earlier this month at the Music and Media Conference South by Southwest. I'm deeply concerned right now that the space around companies like Amazon, Facebook, Google is now referred to by venture capitalists as the kill zone. So my view is break those things apart and we will have a much more competitive, robust market in America. Now, there are a lot of ifs here. She'd have to secure the Democratic nomination and win the general election. But 
Let's put her campaign for president aside for a moment. She wants to break up these companies under the 1890 Sherman Act antitrust law, which aims to protect the process of competition, among other things. But her overarching idea made us wonder, is there a precedent for doing something like this and something that might hold lessons for lawmakers today? The closest we could find was the breakup of telecommunications giant AT&T, the Bell System. So we reached Richard John. He's a professor of history and communications at Columbia University and author of Network Nation, Inventing American Telecommunications. And he reminded us that the Bell system first split up in 1913, but the company's power continued to grow, so regulators stepped in again in the 80s. At that time, the Bell company owned the telephone equipment. You didn't own the telephone in your own home, believe it or not. But even more importantly was the way the rates were structured. The idea was to provide low-cost local telephone service so that everybody could make a call across town or order groceries or, or talk to uh, friends and neighbors. Long-distance telephone service, which was uh, operated by a division of the Bell system, was priced quite high. And, and that was a, a key issue in the 84 breakup because there were technical advances and there was a political opening that made it possible for rivals to undercut Bell in the provisioning of long-distance telephone service. The Bell system was always very highly regulated, and that was one of the reasons it was so successful. Regulation and innovation have often gone hand in glove in the United States. I'm curious if you could tell us about uh, a settlement in 1913 that goes even further back. It's startling because it was the first great antitrust suit in telecommunications, so in a sense it's, it's the... It's the er narrative for uh, what's going on uh, today. Uh, and like so many of these uh, antitrust suits, it has, a, it has a tangled history, but it had a very important outcome. In 1890, Congress enacted a law to make illegal restraints against trade and monopolizing. Now, those are two things that are very broad. It's like free speech or freedom of religion, and it's very hard to know what those two things mean. But by 1911, there was a consensus that certain kinds of business behavior would be declared by the courts to violate the Sherman Act, particularly pricing, price fixing, or any kind of agreement or certain kinds of market concentration above a percentage. But it's very hard to know precisely what those boundaries were. And that was the issue that the Supreme Court was being asked to adjudicate in 1913 when Bell, working together with a attorney general who was really quite aggressive, they got together and they agreed that Bell would divest itself of Western Union, which was a telegraph network provider. Was the thinking there that they would have been too big and too powerful? Yes, too big, too powerful, unaccountable. But just as importantly, Bell agrees that it will, in effect, work with the federal government, work with the courts, work with the Interstate Commerce Commission to financially protect the rest of the telephone sector. And that bargain, that grand bargain, would be in place from 1913 right through to 1984. Mm. So for listeners, it's a complicated agreement, yeah. but it shows how lawmakers, who are really quite aggressive and hostile, toward a major corporation, one of the biggest corporations in the world, can force it to do something that it didn't want to do, with the ultimate result being the benefit for the public good. That's an interesting lesson. So it was a settlement and not, um, they weren't forced to do it. Correct. The, these are politically negotiated settlements. And yet if they still needed to step in in 84. To put simply what happened in 84 was that there was a deal that Bell cut with regulators, mostly at the state level in the 50s and 60s, that came apart in the 1970s, in part because you have new methods of, of sending messages long distance. Older listeners may remember you used to punch in all those numbers to get a sprint line. Right. So there, there, was a, there was a technical change that kind of forced the issue. But there was also a breakdown in the consensus that we should coordinate communication networks uh, as, in effect, uh, if not a, if not a legal monopoly, but a single dominant player. Ronald Reagan didn't want to break up the Bell system. It was not an issue about which there were thousands of Americans uh, signing petitions and lobbying. It, it, it was an initiative that was uh, promoted by a Texas judge. 
and some of the suppliers of the equipment. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, Boston University students, faculty, leadership, alumni, friends, and listeners to this great new city space here at WBUR. I'm proud to welcome all of you to the inaugural Paul Streeton Distinguished Lecture in Global Development Policy that celebrates the example and legacy of Boston University Professor Paul Streeton. My name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm a professor at the Party School for Global Studies, and I direct the Global Development Policy Center here, or the GDP Center, as we like to call it. Uh, the GDP Center is pleased to co-sponsor this event with the Department of Economics and their Institute for Economic Development. Before I introduce our distinguished guests who we chose to be the inaugural recipient of the Streeton Lectureship, the Nobel Laureate Joseph Stiglitz, please allow me to say a few words about Paul Streeton and the history and trajectory of development policy here at BU. Following Professor Stiglitz's remarks, my colleague Dilip Mukherjee and I uh, will lead us in a question and answer session with Professor Stiglitz, and we'll have a short reception out here to follow. And before I start, I really want to uh, thank WBUR City Space, the BU Department of Alumni Relations, uh, the staff at the Department of Economics, and the GDP Center for all the hard work they did to make this happen and for, to get all of you into this room. Uh, Paul Streeton, uh, Professor Emeritus at BU's Department of Economics, died on January 6th, 2019, at the age of 101. His wife of 67 years, Ann Streeton, predeceased him just by a few months. He's survived by two daughters, a stepson, two grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. And we're really proud to establish this lectureship in his honor. Sitting in these two seats right here are supposed to be Tish and Thule, his daughter and granddaughter, but they had tickets on WOW Airlines from Iceland. And despite what WOW says, they did not get everybody where they were supposed to be. The GDP Center staff's been trying to get them here since 10 o'clock yesterday, so we're really sad that uh, we don't have members of the street and family with us uh, today. Paul Streeton was born in Vienna, Austria. He served in World War II and went on to teach at Oxford, the University of Sussex, where he co-founded and directed the renowned Institute for Development Studies, and later became professor of economics here at BU from 1980 to 1993, where he was the founder and director of the World Development Institute. Streeton made significant contributions to economic theory of industry and trade, published his work in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the Review of Economic Studies, the Journal of International Economics, and the American Economic Review. He also founded what has become the world's leading interdisciplinary journal in development studies, World Development. Uh, his groundbreaking scholarly books, such as First Things First, Meeting Basic Human Needs in the Developing Countries, and Thinking About Development, continue to be influential to this day. As is the tradition here at Boston University, Paul Streeton put his academic work into action. He served as Deputy Director General of the United Kingdom's Ministry of Overseas Development. He was Senior Advisor to the World Bank and helped to formulate the bank's policies on basic needs during the 1970s. And his scholarly work led the foundations to what later became the United Nations Human Development Index, which emphasized the importance of education and human health as essential components of the development process. He remained active well after his retirement, continuing to speak around the world and expanding the domain of development economics into environmental sustainability, governance, and beyond. He came back in 2010, and he was a visiting professor at the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future, where he lectured on globalization and technology. This is going to be an annual prize, and it really has three goals. One, and first and foremost, it honors the impact and legacy of Paul Streeton's scholarship and policy engagement. Second, the lectureship seeks to shine light on scholars working in a street and tradition who pursue rigorous scientific work while connecting with other disciplines in the policy community to advance better development outcomes. And third, the lectureship hopes to inspire younger scholars to pursue interdisciplinary research on pressing development problems and engage actively with the policy community. Paul Streeton is part of a long legacy and strong trajectory on development here at BU. It all began back in 1953, just as the field of development was being founded with the opening of the African Studies Center, which is now housed at the Party School of Global Studies. The African Studies Center has provided a strong foundation in African studies to generations of BU students and professors, as well as development practitioners and, devel and diplomats to this day. In economics, the legacy starts when Paul Rosenstein Rodin, 
one of the pioneers of development economics, established the Center for Latin American Studies here in 1974. This was followed by the formation of other regional development centers and then the launch of Streeton's World Development Institute. Rosenstein, Rodan, Streeton, and colleagues such as Gus Papanak, who is here with us today, were tapped by presidents in the United States and abroad to help devise development strategies. And their work remains enshrined in development economics textbooks and in numerous BU alum who went on to become finance ministers, development bankers, and academics in their own right. It would be remiss not to mention the late John Harris, a distinguished professor in the economics department who passed away last year. His article on the determinants of migration and urban unemployment was chosen as one of the top economics papers of all time. In more recent decades, the department and the IED, the Institute for Inter Economic Development, continue to build on and advance this le legacy. Dilip Mukherjee has done pioneering work on the political economy of decentralization, on property rights, credit frictions, and inequality with various co-authors. Andy Newman's work on matching inequality, segregation is quite notable as well, and the list goes on. The traditional, tradition of policy-oriented development research subsequently expanded across the university as the understanding of the key elements of the development process have expanded as well over the years. Perhaps one of the most dynamic hubs of development policy research over the past few decades has been at BU School of Public Health, uh, especially but not limited to the Department of Global Health there. This year, the Question School of Business will celebrate 40 years of Hubert Humphrey Fellows, uh, young professionals from emerging market and developing country, finance ministries, central banks, and the private sector who come to BU for a year. One important graduate of the Humphrey Fellows program, Jin Lachoon, is now the president of the newly formed Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. I'll end with the newest kid on the block, the GDP Center. Uh, we're administered by the Vice President and Associate Provost for Research, Gloria Waters, who's here with us, and the Party School of Global Studies. The newish Party School puts advancing human progress and poly en policy engagement at the core of what we do. Our Dean, Adil Najam, who's here? Way in the back. We have a seat for you in the front. Um, <laughs> Uh, pr uh, practices what he preaches from the, from the very top of, of our school. Uh, he was the lead author of last year's Human Development Report for his native Pakistan. The mission of the GDP Center is to advance policy-oriented research on financial stability, human well-being, and the environment across the world. And we've established four research initiatives on human capital, land use and livelihoods, global economic governance, and something we call the Global China Initiative. Our core faculty are economists, geographers, political scientists, biostatisticians, and legal scholars. In just a couple of years, the GDP Center has published rigorous academic work in top social and natural science journals on the economics of HIV AIDS, on women, migration, and remittances in Indonesia, on the impacts of policy interventions on maternal health in Malawi, on the scale and impact of Chinese overseas development finance, on the factors that determine farmers' decisions to deforest in the Amazon, and on the impact of trade and investment treaties on access to essential medicines. We've also engaged many graduate students from across the university and across the world, and have something called a Summer in the Field program, you just missed the deadline for it, unfortunately, where we send uh, master students and undergrads abroad to work on de with development organizations. But we only start there. Last year, we were inaugurated by Ban Ki-moon, who tasked us to not only be a university-based think tank, but also to be a do tank that advances scholarly work out into the policy community to try to advance the sustainable development goals. And to that end, we've done a lot already. Jacob Bohr's econometric work showing that investment in secondary schools reduces the incidence of HIV AIDS, what he calls a social vaccine, has led to a multi-million dollar program to build schools across sub-Saharan Africa. Sam Bazi is working with the Indonesian Agency for the Placement and Protection of Indonesian Workers to improve the choices and information to female migrant workers overseas. Suchi Gopal, Julie Klinger, and Rebecca Ray are working with indigenous groups and civil society in the Andean Amazon and in the Mekong to better equip them to mitigate the impacts of large development, imp uh, development projects on their uh, ecology and livelihoods. Bill Grimes, uh, William Kring, and Perry Merling, who we're excited to have here and who joins us to set up a new program on central banking and financial stability, have participated in G20 commissions to reform global economic governance institutions. If you know anything about Professor Joseph Striglitz, by now you will understand why perhaps he, more than anyone else in his profession, exemplifies rigorous academic achievement 
with sound theory-driven and evidence-based policy advice on economic development and what you might call a street and tradition. Joseph Stiglitz was born in a steel town of Gary, Indiana, studied at Amherst College, and later obtained his PhD in economics from MIT. He's taught at Yale, Princeton, Stanford, MIT, and Oxford, and he's now a university professor at Columbia University in New York. One of his early papers, Alternative Theories of Wage Determination and Unemployment in Less Developing Countries, was completed while he was at the Institute for Development Studies in Nairobi while working alongside John Harris, uh, the late John Harris from the Economics Department. Professor Stiglitz has done pathbreaking work on the economics of the public sector, the economics of uncertainty, growth technological change in distribution, and industrial organization. Within his profession, however, Professor Stiglitz is most known for his work on asymmetric information. In a nutshell, when one party to an economic transaction has more knowledge than another, then market institutions can break down or fail. Unfortunately, almost all economic transactions in in involve some form of information asymmetries at some level, as Professor Stiglitz himself has shown in insurance markets, financial markets, labor markets, and in the monetary system. His collective body of work in this area poses fundamental challenges to some of the underpinnings of modern economic theory and the policies governing market economies. This may sound a little shocking, and I hope it's not insulting, because it's not a minute to be. But as incredible and unrivaled as this academic work is, we would not ask Joe Stiglitz to be the inaugural Streeton Lecture solely on that basis. Professor Stiglitz already has had no better recognition for this outstanding academic work than in 2001 when he was awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences, and before that, the John Bakes Clark Medal in 1979. The Paul Streeton Lectureship goes to an economist who has not only made major contributions to the discipline, but to someone who also engages in policies based on such research. As a direct outgrowth of his work on asymmetric information and other matters, Professor Stiglitz has, and I'm only going to mention a few because I could speak longer than his talk will be, uh, has partnered with native Seneca Indians to calculate the magnitude by which they had been cheated in previous years. He worked with the Natural Resources Defense Council to calculate the cost of U.S. offshore oil tracks and their impacts on the environment. In 1992, Professor Stiglitz became a member and later chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and later senior vice president for development policy and chief economist at the World Bank. Upon leaving the World Bank, Professor Stiglitz has written best-selling books that expand his insights and experience to a broader audience thus deepening the global policy discourse and economic policy. His first book in this vein, Globalization and Its Discontents, became an international bestseller for showing how the International Monetary Fund and the United States Treasury forced developing countries to deregulate their financial markets even though such policies had little theoretical basis or empirical support in the economics profession. He has since written some of the definitive books on the financial crisis, inequality, the euro crisis, globalization and trade, the list goes on. His latest book is called People, Power, and Profits, Progressive Capitalism in an Age of Discontent, and it's due out later this month by Norton. He's chaired numerous high-level commissions. Somehow he's the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute, and of course he's established the Initiative for Policy Dialogue, which is one of the foremost university-based think tanks on development policy in the world. To honor the impact of, and legacy of Paul Streeton's scholarship and policy engagement, to shine light on scholars working in the street and tradition, and to inspire younger scholars to research pressing development problems and engage with the policy community. Friends at Boston University, I introduce to you Joseph Stiglitz. Well, thank you for that uh, very flattering, wonderful uh, introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, at BU, uh, where there's been a long tradition in development. Uh, Gus Popanek and, and John Harris and, 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 and obviously Paul Streeton. Um, I don't want to spend much time uh, uh, talking about Paul Streeton's work. I didn't uh, know Paul well. Um, but one of his basic contributions uh, to development economics was this idea of basic needs that uh, broadened perspective beyond traditional economics and uh, reflected the kind of humanity uh, that 
that this lectureship uh, it calls attention to. Uh, over time, it's had an enormous amount of influence. It evolved, uh, particularly under the influence of Marchesen, into something called the capabilities approach. And that was then embedded in the, the uh, HDI, the Human Development Index, which is a standard way in which people look at how well different countries are doing, which tries to get beyond just looking at GDP or income and bring in other aspects like uh, health and, and education. So it's a real pleasure uh, for me to be here um, to honor uh, uh, Paul Streeton. What I want to, uh, the, the topic I'm going to talk about is, as I say, multilateralism and, and development. And let me, uh, Got it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me t uh, begin by just summarizing the, the main messages I want to talk about, and that is that multilateralism is of crucial importance, um, especially for development. The United States uh, led in the period after World War II in creating the rules-based international order, but unfortunately now is leading to its destruction. Uh, but an important lesson for other countries uh, is that multilateralism is too important to be allowed to be destroyed by any single country, let alone any single individual. And finally, uh, this being an important research institution, I think there, there is an important research agenda to be done to understand better the appropriate set of rules for global economic uh, governance. So let me begin by talking a little bit about uh, some of the changing perspectives on multilateralism. Uh, before, uh, the global system uh, was criticized as being unfair to developing countries and emerging markets. That was the point of my earlier book, uh, Globalization and Discontents. Uh, there were problems of governance, uh, insufficient voice, unfair rules, uh, assistance that was accompanied by inappropriate conditionalities, and uh, the monetary and other policies of the large systemic countries like the United States and the EU uh, were undertaken with little regard to the consequences elsewhere, especially among emerging markets and developing countries. When the United States, uh, in the aftermath of the 2008 uh, crisis, undertook QE, uh, quantitative easing, they didn't pay any attention to the impact it would have on developing countries, the, the, the Russia money coming into those countries, which was, had a very destabilizing uh, effect. Um, and some of them said, well, that was their problem, uh, not, not the United States, that our, our, we should focus just on what's good for the United States. Well, now the world uh, confronts an unraveling of multilateralism. Uh, an undermining of the rules-based trading system, and more broadly, uh, the international rule of law, uh, and cooperative efforts to address global problems that can only be solved by multilateralism, the most important being climate change, but also all the rules, that, you know, nuclear proliferation, all the rules, that are, uh, all the things that affect all of us globally are only going to be solved by uh, uh, global action, multilateralism. Uh, and the reason that within a country that we have rules of law is that it is uh, basic to, to the way we can interact with each other. And, and one of the important uh, things that the reason we are so much better off than we were 250 years ago is that we've learned how to uh, cooperate and to work together at a large scale. You know, in an agrarian economy, you didn't need that kind of cooperation. You just have, you were a farmer, an isolated farmer. But as we become a complex uh, society, industrial, post-industrial society, you need cooperation. And for that cooperation to work, you need rules. And that's why the foundation of the rule of law. But as we become a global society, we need r rules as well. And that is the foundation of why we need an international rule of law. It's obviously difficult because uh, 
We don't have an international real government. We have the UN who facilitates cooperation. So still the basic unit is uh, the nation state. And that makes global governance more difficult, global economics more difficult. But um, it is still the case that uh, the only approach to having a successful world is, is multilateralism. And it should be obvious that brute power politics is even worse than unbalanced multilateralism and will be particularly disadvantageous for developing countries and emerging markets. And you know that, that really is the premise that uh, the current administration is pursuing, that because it is bigger than most other countries, it, in the absence of a rule of law, it will win out. But I think that is wrong because it ignores the possibility of uh, the fact that we are a place that will be less trustworthy, uh, less stable, uh, for doing international business because it isn't part of the international rule of law. So the, what, um, what is uh, particularly disturbing is, as I said before, that U.S. played a key role in establishing the system. But it wasn't just a matter of altruism. Uh, it also served U.S. interests. The problems presented by uh, globalization, uh, for instance, deindustrialization uh, are not the result of unfair international rules or others taking advantage of the U.S. Um, sometimes you get the impression that the current administration thinks that previous administrations were snookered by very smart trade ministers from developing countries. But I can tell you that's not true. Uh, the basic fact is that those international agreements were basically written by the United States. Uh, a little, EU had a little role in it. And when I say by the United States, mostly by our corporate interests. And that is the problem, because they weren't written by you and me, they weren't written by, through a, a very democratic process, but they were, were written by the United States. So the problem wasn't with uh, being snookered by other countries, the problem was with what we wanted, um, what our uh, USTR, what our trade negotiators wanted, and what they were uh, interested, as I'll explain a little bit later, um, is basically advancing uh, their, their own commercial corporate interests. The problems that we've been seeing, the deindustrialization of large parts of America, is really uh, a result of our failure to help in restructuring of the U.S. economy, the absence, for instance, of industrial and active labor market policies to help people move from jobs that are being destroyed to jobs that are being created, and inadequate systems of social protection. The fact is that other countries have done a lot better job. So it isn't globalization that is the problem. You know, globalization is a global phenomena. <laughs> But other countries, particularly, for, for instance, the, the Scandinavian countries, have done a lot better job of helping people move from the jobs that are being destroyed to the new jobs that are being created and making sure that new jobs are being created and they're created in places where, where the people are. So um, the lesson is that protectionism and the retreat from multilateralism won't solve the problems uh, of deindustrialization and the other problems we're facing, and I think it will actually uh, make them worse. Um, what we need is systems of social protection without protectionism. And that was uh, the motivation of my writing a book, uh, uh, coming out with a new uh, version of the book that uh, he referred to called Globalization and Discontents Revisited, Anti-Globalization in the Era of Trump. So. After uh, Trump started going, I, I couldn't help but but revisit these issues and try, uh, as, you know, not that I expected him to read it, but <laughs> uh, but maybe somebody around him might read it and understand uh, where they were going wrong. So uh, it was my attempt to help the country. Well, uh, these problems have many manifestations, and uh, I'll talk about. Uh, the, uh, a, a few of them, uh, in particular trade, 
uh, the seriousness of the problem is, uh, can't be underestimated. Um, you know, we all know about you know, the trade conflict with China. That's gotten a lot of the headlines. But something that hasn't gotten very much headlines is the WTO is about to be uh, disempowered. Uh, a key part of the WTO, which was a multilateral rules-based system, a key part is a system of adjudicating disputes. In any uh, trade relationship, you're going to have disputes. And a rule of law says you have to have a way of fairly adjudicating those disputes. And the WTO created what has turned out to be, a, 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 I think most people think, is a, a reasonably well-performing set of courts, you can call it, appellate bodies. Well, uh, the United States has refused to allow the appointment of judge, new judges as the old judges retire. By the end of this year, there will not be a quorum uh, in the WTO appellate body, and the WTO will not be able to adjudicate disputes. So this is uh, really a, a serious uh, threat to the international rule of law, done not without, uh, you know, without fanfare, just very quietly under the, under the radar screen, but with devastating effects. As I mentioned before, the U.S. believes it has advantage in bilateral negotiations with smaller countries. It has uh, a misconceived focus on bilateral trade deficits. I hope all of you who are students uh, understand that what matters is the multilateral trade deficit and that the multilateral trade deficit is basically determined by the disparity between domestic investment and domestic savings and that because of the tax bill that was signed, really the worst tax bill ever, signed in uh, December of 2017 and the ex increase in expenditures in January 2018, um, it was predictable that the trade deficit, the multilateral trade deficit, would go up. And that's exactly what's happened. It's reached new record levels. So while he's talking about renegotiating trade deals, bilateral trade agreements, that will affect whether we import clothes from, from China or from Vietnam, that won't make any difference for jobs in America. But uh, the multilateral trade deficit, which he began by talking about, will actually be worse. Um, but there are other manifestations of this withdrawal from multilateralism. The withdrawal from the uh, Paris climate change uh, is extraordinarily serious. Uh, the good news is that California, uh, New York, a lot of cities, a lot of corporations are saying, we don't care if uh, Trump withdraws, we are going to still uh, uh, meet our obligations. And uh, private philanthropists are, have stepped forward and met the U.S. Uh, uh, obligations in terms of supporting the, the secretariat. But there's also uh, equally serious withdrawal from efforts to contain nuclear proliferation. That, again, is a, a global public good. We don't want to burn up a nuclear uh, holocaust. And uh, only can be done through multilateral. Uh, the agreements may be imperfect, but, uh, you know, as one person said, uh, you know, a leaky umbrella uh, protects you a little bit on a rainy day, it's better to have that than no umbrella at all. So these agreements, I think, uh, are important. The effects of the trade war are already manifest. Uh, the global slowdown that's going on are, uh, is partly attributed to the impact of the uncertainty on investment. Um, and you see this, uh, I just came back from uh, China a couple of days ago, and uh, it's, it's very clear that uh, the, the uncertainty has made everybody, you know, they don't know whether to invest in China, to invest somewhere else. And the same thing is true in the United States. Uh, so all this uncertainty is, is bad uh, uh, for the economy. The actual shock to the global economy from a trade war with China would be even greater. But what has happened with the undermining of... Uh, agreements, the leaving Iran agreement when there was no real basis for it, uh, um, the other withdrawal from agreements, is that not even an agreement would resolve the uncertainty. 
No agreement can resolve many of the underlying issues. Maybe in the discussion we, we may come to that. But it has meant that the US policy is largely unpredictable. And uh, Trump has shown little hesitancy in going back on agreements. Um, and this exacerbates uh, some fundamental uncertainties that we were facing in any case, which is of returning to normal after uh, the Great Recession. Let me just make a, a, a slight aside about the uh, 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 a slight aside about the uh, new trade agreements. The only one, the, there are two two agreements that have been completed. One is the Korea-U.S. agreement, and the other one is the Mexico agreement with Mexico and Canada. Um, and if you look at the details, you realize how um, minor. You know, he said these were the worst agreements ever. And if they were the worst agreements ever, the fact that you could change them by moving a comma, make them the best agreement ever, uh, is uh, calls into question his first statement. Um, the the Korean uh, uh, there are just a couple of things in the Korea agreement. One of them was uh, Korea has higher uh, car safety standards. And um, uh, under the previous agreement, uh, they allow 25,000 unsafe American cars into Korea. Um, but Koreans didn't want to buy them. So uh, while they allowed them, they're, they're, didn't make the constraint wasn't binding because nobody wanted to buy them. So the new agreement says that now Koreans can buy 50,000 cars, which they won't buy. So, so it's made a big difference. Um, the, uh, there was a, a, another provision uh, that actually took uh, uh, many other, uh, it took central banks by surprise because it said that uh, basically, um, uh, Korea had to uh, coordinate uh, its monetary policy with the United States. Uh, evidently, it was not. It was a provision that was put in with uh, nobody in uh, uh, the Federal Reserve or anybody else being consulted on it, um, and uh, had no enforcement mechanisms. So it won't make any difference. It caused a little bit of anxiety among other central bankers. It got absolutely no attention anywhere, as far as I'm sure none of you have know about this. It was just one of the central bankers in, in, in Asia was very, very upset about it. But he was, as far as I know, the only person who knew about this. Um, <laughs> so that was one, uh, that was the Korea-US agreement. The uh, uh, agreement uh, between Mexico and Canada uh, has uh, a couple of provisions. Um, but are relatively small adjustments, especially on, on trade. Um, there are a couple, couple things that are important. There were, uh, in the area of uh, pharmaceuticals, it was trying to rebalance, make it uh, more difficult for generics, uh, in particular in biologics. So it's, uh, rebalancing for big pharma. It was a big pharma bill relative to uh, uh, generics. Well. Uh, the, there, there are a, a number of detailed other provisions that we may have time to talk about later, but the fact is that it's, it's not a big, big deal. But while the trade agreements uh, uh, have, uh, uh, the new trade agreements are not a big deal, the impacts of the changed U.S. attitudes will be longstanding. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, U.S. has been the champion of multilateralism. And what the U.S. has now done has reminded everyone, borders still matter. The nation state is still the basic unit. And that uh, if you're a large country, you can just walk away from agreements uh, almost with impunity. Um, there are three other things that have been a warning to other countries engaging in uh, negotiations with uh, the U.S. And I can tell you, the negotiators are very aware of this. It doesn't tell them what to do, but the, it, it, it just increases their anxiety. Uh, one of them is that uh, what is agreed by the negotiator may not be accepted by Trump. 
Uh, on two occasions, uh, or more than two occasions, China and the United States uh, reached an agreement, and they brought the agreement back to the United States. It was a reasonable agreement. Uh, they thought they had made major concessions, and then Trump said no. Uh, he wanted tariffs. Uh, he wanted a trade war. Um, and what is agreed one day may not be acceptable the next day. Uh, it's also the case that ratification by Congress uh, remains problematic. And uh, the third thing is that U.S. can break breaks agreements with impunity. So uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, developing countries will have to live with uh, a great deal of uncertainty. And this is a time of, uh, of uh, This is a time of great macroeconomic certainty with slowdown in China, weaknesses in Europe, and slowdown in the United States. Um, but I'm, uh, given the limited amount of time, I'm going to uh, uh, not talk about those uh, particular uncertainties, uh, but move on to uh, a set of issues focusing on development. Uh, and that is. Uh, Uh, the dangers of uh, increasing uh, debt. Um, one of the ways that developing countries, you know, what, when you're a developing country, you need resources. One of the, and I'm going to talk about the various ways they get resources. One of the ways they get resources is by borrowing. And one of the problems of borrowing is sometimes you can't pay back what you borrow. Um, and uh, the question is, what happens when you can't pay back what you borrow? Um, and it's always a question about who's to blame. Uh, the lender, in my mind, is often much more informed, often more sophisticated than the borrower. And so in a sense, that any contract alone between a willing lender and a willing borrower, the lender is as much to blame uh, as the borrower. Uh, but uh, putting aside the issue of, of blame, uh, the question is when, a, uh, when, when you can't repay, what happens? Well, we know what used to happen when uh, countries couldn't repay. Uh, you send your army in, and uh, you solve the problem uh, that way. Uh, uh, England took over uh, the Suez Canal, uh, took over uh, the Suez Canal and Egypt, uh, um, and uh, our, uh, one of our uh, earlier uh, encounters, people have forgotten, a little over 100 years ago with Venezuela was when Venezuela uh, failed to repay uh, its debt. And uh, uh, gunboats went down to Venezuela and started uh, uh, shooting. And uh, there was a general view uh, that that wasn't quite civilized uh, way of, of dealing with it. Within our countries, the way we deal with it, we have bankruptcy laws. We say, you know, if you can't repay, uh, they used to, in the UK, you would go to debtor's prison. But being in prison was not a good way of getting, being able to repay your debt. Um, and we figured that out. It took us a, a hundred years or so, but, but uh, uh, we sent some people to Australia. The uh, UK sent some people to Australia. And, um, but anyway, uh, the, the point is that um, uh, we become more civilized, we think, and, and we don't have debtor's prison, and we have bankruptcy provisions. Uh, and we want, as we, the bankruptcy provisions are supposed to maintain the economy, um, not destroy assets. And quite often, the creditor gets back more in an organized bankruptcy than in, uh, certainly, than in a debtor prison. Well, internationally, uh, we, we, don't, we don't have any way of resolving uh, debt. Uh, so... There is uh, no adequate uh, framework for sovereign debt resolution. Um, in the case of many of the poor countries, the developing countries, they had so much debt that it was really uh, impeding their development, that, that, that all their money was going to pay the creditors, 
And so uh, at, at the turn of the uh, century, um, we had uh, an initiative called HIPAC, the Highly Indebted uh, Poor Countries, uh, where we uh, gave debt forgiveness. It's only been 19 years since that debt forgiveness, actually less than that, because it took a while. Um, and many developing countries are back into high levels of debt. And uh, the last major debt crisis uh, uh, in a developing country, an emerging market, was Argentina, 2001. Greece has had a problem, and so there have been other countries. Uh, um, the, uh, at the time of the Argentina crisis, there was a recognition uh, that we ought to have a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, some way like an international bankruptcy law. So that required multilateralism. We had to come together and say, what are, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, how do we resolve this debt problem? But uh, unfortunately, back then, uh, the United States again vetoed this international effort. Um, I'm not quite sure what the motivation was. Well, I think I do know. The, the creditors, many of whom were in, uh, in New York and the United States, thought they could do better by using brute force. And uh, the vulture funds, who are by the debt and speculate on it, were particularly influential uh, in, the, in the Bush administration. And, and they said, you know, don't have a rule of law. Let it be a jungle. And in that jungle, since we're stronger, we'll beat them up. And um, uh, that view, I think, is, is obviously not one that uh, uh, any development uh, likes, nor is it actually one that is actually good for the capital market. Anybody concerned about it, uh, because it creates a lot of uncertainty. So uh, there, in, uh, in the aftermath of some of the consequences of the Argentina crisis that went on for more than uh, a decade, uh, resolving their debt, there was a global effort to <clears throat> create a sovereign debt uh, resolu uh, uh, framework. And um, it was centered at our most important multilateral institution, the UN. And uh, they adopted uh, a set of principles um, for a, a framework uh, for sovereign debt restructuring. Uh, it was almost unanimous, but unfortunately, the opposition were a couple uh, uh, large countries, uh, most importantly, the United States. And so while there's been these principles and there's a lot of discussion about how to go forward, uh, it's very difficult with the opposition in the United States uh, for, um, for, for this to go forward. Uh, on the slide, I have a couple of technical points. Uh, the, the U.S. has said, well, uh, all you need is something called collective action clauses, which are rules about uh, how uh, the debtors get together and a majority can vote. Um, but uh, that won't work. If they were, we wouldn't need a bankruptcy law within the country. So the fact is that... Um, uh, uh, the, the not having a multilateral system is really very costly. And it's another example of U.S. trying to undermine multilateralism. My view is with uh, more of global savings coming from emerging markets, uh, they working with a coalition of willing developed countries should take more leadership in shaping the global financial system and, and work out a, a way of dealing with the debt. Now, this, similar issues can be uh, raised with respect to uh, lots of the other aspects of fi financing uh, uh, development. Um, and I'll talk very briefly about four of these, uh, taxation, private flows, uh, public flows, and what I call curbing uh, the reverse flows. The issue of taxation has become uh, very much at the center of uh, policy debate. Uh, 
in many cases, emerging countries and developing countries are uh, markets and developing countries are not getting the taxes they should be getting from multinational corporations. Uh, that is to say, uh, they're not getting the taxes reflecting the economic activity that occurs within their country. Uh, there's been a lot of innovation uh, by American firms, particularly in tax avoidance. Uh, and uh, some of our most innovative firms uh, in other areas have been uh, as innovative or even more innovative in tax uh, avoidance innovation. Um, the Apple, uh, which most might have you have, uh, is become emblematic of tax uh, evaders, avoiders. Uh, they, in Europe, they did the uh, famous deal with Ireland where uh, they, all the profits of Europe went to uh, a Irish subsidiary, and then they took advantage of another provision of Irish law, which was that if the Irish subsidiary was controlled outside of Ireland, it didn't face any taxes. So um, the net tax uh, paid by Apple on its profits in Europe was about 0.05 of 1%. Um, and uh, so, it, it, you know, I think it was just a token. Uh, I don't know why they paid even that amount, uh, but, but I guess they had to uh, persuade Ireland that they could get something out of it. Um, but Starbucks, uh, Google are all competing in the sphere of tax avoidance to see who can figure out um, th these. And they have very clever names, the, the double du uh, Dutch uh, the Irish uh, sandwich and so on. Um, it's a, a race to the bottom, and uh, I think the developing countries need to work together to reach agreement against such harmful tax competition. Uh, I can't help but mention, because uh, Apple tried the same thing within the United States to get tax competition between New York, all the cities of what, where, they, where they would locate their second headquarters. And uh, at first, New York fell for it and uh, uh, gave them a billion dollar, uh, several uh, uh, tax um, uh, rebate. rebate. Well, uh, the, the fact is that, that that tax is going to be borne by other people and gives them an unlevel playing field. So, um, uh, and, uh, and so the question is, uh, uh, should that tax competition be allowed? In Europe, the view is very strongly no. That uh, that was called state aid, and it unlevels the playing field, and that's what got caught. Uh, that's what caught uh, uh, Apple. Uh, it, it wasn't the tax competition of low rates; it was the special deals that they were getting. Well. The international community has agreed that there should be a uh, initiative called the base uh, uh, to try to curb this. It's called the BEPS or base erosion profit shifting. The idea is shifting your profits to low tax jurisdictions. And as I say, Starbucks did this uh, really well for fr franchise fees. You can do it through intellectual property. And there's a major effort at reaching a new consensus in a direction that would deprive developing countries of needed revenue um, and that's uh, this destination-based uh, cash flow tax, which means basically not taxing where the production occurs, but taxing where the sales occurs, which would be very bad for emerging markets and developing countries. So um, the reforms are now uh, uh, realizing that there's a fundamental problem um, the, fu the fundamental problem is with the transfer system of multinational taxation. Um, uh, the, the transfer pricing uh, system uh, says that when you s move goods across the border, you value the uh, output as if it were an arm's length transaction, what a market transaction. But there is no market for uh, uh, a chip uh, that uh, uh, for a, a way for all of these things occur uh, inside a, a firm. Uh, 
There's no market for a shirt without a sleeve uh, or a, you know, uh, a collar. Uh, there's no, f so you, you gives you enormous discretion in choosing your prices. And that's why within the United States, as goods move back and forth across the states all the time, no one would pretend that we ought to have a transfer price system. We use what is called a formulaic system. And uh, that, that is where uh, uh, those who are trying to reform the uh, uh, multilateral tr uh, corporate tax system are, are saying is, you know, once you have global integration, you have to go move away from this transfer price system into uh, the formulaic system. There are some hopeful notes. Some countries are thinking about imposing a minimum global tax motivated by outrage of tax avoidance and evasion. And uh, if that were done, it would enable developing countries to raise tax rates up to the minimum level without adverse economic effects. Um, and right now, Europe, uh, many countries in Europe are thinking about imposing a broad uh, digital tax. So let me come to uh, uh, a little bit of the problems in global, uh, in private capital flows. And here I want to focus most particularly on short-term flows. Um, the, one of the problems is that there is a certain short-termism. Uh, much of the savings in, in our economy is long-term. People saving for the retirement, sovereign wealth funds, saving for per per perpetuity. And much of the investment needs are long-term. Uh, investment needs in infrastructure, uh, as an example. But it's standing in between our short-term financial markets. The multilateral development banks can play a critical role in putting together projects that address the needs of savers and investors, including structuring risk appropriately. And this was, of course, uh, part of the philosophy of the new development banks, uh, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, I was involved in the, uh, creating the, the BRICS Bank, uh, which is uh, the bank of the, the BRICS. Uh, um, and, and, and what they were looking for is, you know, new mandates, focusing on more on climate change, global public goods, uh, uh, new governance, the problems of the governance in the, uh, and, and uh, new instruments. Um, there are problems posed by the rating agencies, uh, which I can't get into, but, but which have limited their expansion. But the new development banks, um, both the AIB and, and, and uh, the BRICS Bank, are actually expanding very rapidly. Um, so um, the, the short-term flows uh, have a problem of uh, instability. And uh, that instability insta has been a major source of crises. Money comes into a country and then moves out. And that hot money, when it comes in, creates a bubble, a, a housing bubble or a, a, a stock market bubble. But when it moves out, it creates the bubble breaks. And uh, the exchange rate moves up and down, and, and it creates a lot of volatility. So uh, one of the, uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, chief economist at the World Bank, um, uh, one of my main jobs was to criticize the IMF. And <laughs> they didn't always uh, appreciate, uh, I was, it was all constructive, I thought. Uh, <laughs> but the, um, uh, at the time, uh, their um, uh, chief economist uh, suggested that uh, uh, to uh, advocate systems of capital account management, capital controls, ways of stabilizing, uh, was uh, selling snake oil, was the word uh, he used. Um, well, I got a certain uh, pleasure. In 2011 and 12, the IMF changed their view to agree that uh, snake oil was a good thing. Uh, they, they changed their institutional view about short-term capital. Um, and it was actually, uh, the story was actually uh, interesting what motivated that in part. Uh, it was partly research that showed how bad this was. It was a par partly a particular event. Uh, US QE uh, had led to a enormous flows of capital uh, into uh, some emerging markets, uh, like Brazil, 
uh, some semi, uh, you know, uh, um, and the result of that was the exchange rates increased. And they wanted to say, we want to dampen this flow to stabilize our exchange rate. And uh, one of the countries um, which was affected was Israel. And uh, the uh, head of the Central Bank of Israel uh, had been uh, a senior official in the uh, IMF when they were uh, saying uh, no to uh, capital controls. But where you sit affects where you stand. And uh, now that he was sitting in the position of a central bank in a country that was being uh, devastated because their exports were, uh, would not have uh, survived if the exchange rate went up. And so they came to the IMF, at least the story goes, and said, please, can you bless us as we intervene in the exchange rate? And, uh, they, and, and supported by the research, uh, they did that. Um, there are uh, other problems in private capital flows. Um, one of them is, and this goes to the real capital flows, um, is uh, that they're, they're covered by what are called bilateral, uh, by investment agreements. Um, and the idea behind an investment agreement seems to be something that everybody should agree with. Uh, investment agreements sound like they're about protecting property rights. And so the idea is that it, by giving protection to property rights, it facilitates more private, foreign direct investment, and that will help developing countries. So that was the story. But you have to be very careful in distinguishing what's actually in the words in an investment agreement plus versus what they say they're doing. If they're really concerned about expropriation, expropriations don't happen very often, and the World Bank and the U.S. government and most other, many other countries have insurance policies you can buy. And so expropriation is not, you know, if that's the risk, we, you can get that risk off the table at a very minuscule cost. So if they're not about uh, that, what are they about? Well. Some people say they're about discrimination, but they're not about discrimination, because if they were about discrimination, they'd be very simple. You just have a few pages, you can say, don't discriminate. <laughs> what they're really about is trying to stop regulations. And uh, they're trying to stop uh, a whole variety of regulations in the environment and, and uh, uh, even on the economy, uh, like on capital controls. Um, the provisions uh, have been interpreted to say that if you change a regulation in a way that hurts the bottom line, the country has to compensate you. And they can sue in a private panel, not in a public court, they can sue and create a, a three-person arbitration panel in which the company gets to appoint one of the three people the government, the other, and then the two agree on the third. Very expensive. These processes cost millions of dollars. When Uruguay was sued, it couldn't afford it. It was about a cigarettes. And uh, the, what they, uh, it, it, they were able to win eventually, but because Mayor Bloomberg paid their illegal bills. So that gives you a picture of them. The, they, the, the lawyer who wrote, the Canadian lawyer, who wrote this particular provision, and one of the good things about the new Canadian-Mexican uh, agreement is they've get, basically gotten rid of it, but the lawyer who originally wrote it said, um, if you pass a law uh, restricting our putting in plutonium and baby cereals, and we had all previously done that, we will sue, and we will win. So that was, you know, he, he was being a little bit overdramatic, but, but um, and he wasn't putting plutonium in baby cereal, but it, it gives you the flavor of what this was about. And those of you who are lawyers know this is a, a regulatory taking provision. And it illustrates the complexity of, of trade agreements um, because the Clinton administration had fought very strongly against regulatory taking provisions. Regulatory takings are compensation for regulations. 
And the danger of that is that uh, the, the advocates of regulatory uh, these compensation know that with these provisions, you won't have any environmental regulations. And so it was really an anti-environmental uh, agenda. And they succeeded in stopping this. The quirks agreed, so both in legislative and, and quirks. But while that was going on, inside NAFTA, it was put. And nobody discussed it. And it's really, in my view, a, a failure of civil society as well as the administration, you know, that, that these bills go to hundreds of pages. The, the TPP was 6,000 pages long. So, you know, if you read that, you aren't going to be able to do your job. So, so um, and that's why you re require, need a civil society, an active civil society to sort of identify uh, what is going on. So, the final point I make here is that it might make sense for emerging markets and developing countries to work towards a narrower multilateral investment agreement focusing just on expropriation and discrimination. How many more minutes do I have? Oh, okay. Let me. Uh, uh, there are issues uh, with with the other aspects of of, of uh, there are problems with public flows, but I I, I want to go to uh, two things very quickly and then. Uh, I want to go to the uh, uh, perverse reversing perverse flows. Uh, one of the problems is that money has been f flowing out of developing countries to developed countries. And uh, there are two sources of these reverse flows. One of them is corruption. And, uh, you know, whenever there's corruption, there's always two sides to that. There's a briber and a bribee. Uh, and there's a place where the dirty money goes. And uh, uh, mostly it goes to developed countries. Uh, it goes to places like not just Panama and the Cayman Islands, but to the United States and the UK. And it goes not only into our bank accounts, but into our real estate sector. Uh, when uh, a regulation finally was issued that in a few places in the United States, like New York, you had to disclose who was the owner of apartments costing more than a million dollars when you did the purchase. Um, the true owner. Uh, there was a, a very good New York Times sto uh, story where, where uh, they uh, described one of the new uh, uh, buildings, and uh, I think a vast majority of them did not have people owning them. They were all LLC people. You know, Cayman Islands was the major owner uh, of the building. Um, we, we discovered uh, you know, uh, that some of our students uh, also uh, owned apartments there. Uh, <laughs> so it happens when you're a private university and you have to have uh, fee-paying students. Uh, but uh, so we understood uh, uh, why they were always so well-dressed. Uh, <laughs> See, um, but the, the, the point is that by giving safe haven to these places, we are actually facilitating this corruption. We are facilitating the money leaving the country. If they had no safe haven, there wouldn't be, it, it, wouldn't, it, it would impede this flow of money out of these countries. And the magnitude of these flows out of the country is greater than all the foreign aid that we give it. So uh, this is, I, I think, important. The other one is um, intellectual property rights. Now, it's, it's, uh, intellectual property rights are part of the global innovation system. The question is getting them right, getting the right balance. I mentioned before um, the intellectual property rights provisions of trade agreements, uh, how they deal with, with uh, bio, you know, biologics. We have, uh, in the United States, a patent law that says you get 20 years. But in the trade agreements, we have provisions that extend the effect of intellectual property rights through provisions, technical provisions called uh, data exclusivity and other evergreening, and you extend it. So um, 
uh, the argument is, and and the result of that is over the last uh, uh, twenty years, the magnitude of the flow of money out of developing countries and emerging markets to developed countries to pay these intellectual property rights has become a significant amount of money. Uh, so I think there's a need to rethink the global intellectual property regime. Uh, the provision uh, in, in WTO governing this, called TRIPS, um, was not designed to advance progress in science and technology. Uh, you know, I, I was in the administration when they designed it, and it was very clearly driven not by uh, a concern about innovation broadly, but by the interest of the pharmaceutical and the entertainment industry. And uh, I think this is a, a good moment to rethink the rules, especially important in health. So uh, let me uh, go on. To, I want to spend just a few minutes on uh, the research agenda. Um, much of the uh, policy agenda, uh, the policy economic agenda, has been based on a set of conventional wisdoms which are not well supported by either theoretical or empirical research. And I want to give you three example, two or three examples. And uh, the point of this is uh, to emphasize, in some ways, how little we know and how important the scope for uh, research is in all these areas. So the, the one that, you know, uh, the first one it has to do with free trade. Um, the, princ the idea that free trade is a good idea, free trade is Pareto efficient as everybody benefits, uh, is so ingrained in econ economists, going back to Ricardo and Smith, that to challenge it, uh, you will lose your union card. Um, as an economist, but it actually turns out that uh, the, I, uh, the proving that free trade is good for everybody, uh, it's only true under very uh, restricted conditions. For instance, one of the things I did uh, 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 a number of years ago was to show if there are imperfect risk markets, opening up trade, making trade free, could make everybody in all countries worse off. So it wasn't that it was making just a question of distribution. It could actually, and the reason intuitively is that opening up markets increases risk. And when people face more risk, they will reduce the amount of risk taking. Risk activities may have higher returns. And as they reduce their risk activity, incomes go down across the board. And you look at the whole equilibrium of the whole global economy, and everybody in all the countries are worse off. It was a very idealized model, but it was made uh, to, to make a pedagogic point that our belief that free trade is good for everybody is really condition. Uh, we, don't, we don't think about the underlying uh, assumptions. One of the things that we should have learned from what's happened in the last 35 years is that without government redistribution, Trade liberalization may make workers, especially unskilled workers, worse off in developed countries. Now, that was a theorem that uh, Samuelson and Stoper proved uh, in the 40s. So we all should have known about it. The intuition is very, very simple. If you're importing goods from developing countries, they're going to be more labor-intensive, more unskilled labor-intensive. And if trade is roughly balanced, you're going to be exporting capital intensive. So the demand for labor, the demand for lay, unskilled labor is going to go down. And if you believe in normal downward sloping demand curves with the demand going down, wages are going to go down. It's really that simple. And you know, Samuelson's theorems were a little bit more complicated, but the intuition is really very simple. So it should have been obvious that trade liberalization with uh, developing countries was going to have a negative effect on unskilled laborers un if we didn't do anything about it. So it was true that the size of the economic pie would be bigger. And with a bigger economic pie, everybody could have been made better off. But that requires doing something. And unfortunately, 
the kinds of things that were proposed, like trade adjustment assistance, uh, were resisted. And we didn't do enough of it. We got a little, but not enough. I sort of have pondered why, why did some of the, those in the corporate sector oppose trade adjustment assistance? You would have thought it was in their political interest to get everybody aboard, make everybody better off, and then there'd be even more support for trade liberalization. But there was another agenda. It was, again, reflects a short-sightedness that we often see in our economy, which is with wages low, the effect of, of less demand on labor is lowering wages. And what they saw is the short-term gain of lower wages. They got lower wages abroad, and they got lower wages at home. And what would lower wages mean? Higher profits. So they had a short-sighted interest in opposing this trade adjustment assistance and making the workers uh, worse off. Well, there are other uh, difficult issues uh, going forward. Um, what are the policies that are required to ensure that trade liberalization benefits most citizens? Are there such policies? What should, be, what, what should we do if there aren't? How do we liberalize among countries with fundamentally different values? Values get reflected in our rules and regulations. Different values thus lead to non-tariff barriers. What degree of harmonization is desirable? Uh, two examples, GMO. In Europe, uh, they feel that GMO is not safe. Uh, most Americans have been persuaded uh, that they are safe. Um, I'm not going to answer the scientific question whether they are not, but the issue is, in Europe, they think, because their citizens think that GMO, they have the right to know whether wheat is genetically modified wheat. But the US says, if you let people know that the wheat is genetically modified, which all American wheat is, it is a trade barrier, because nobody will buy American wheat. So we've been arguing that people shouldn't know. Transparency is a trade barrier. Now, you can say, see from the way that I've phrased this that I'm probably not uh, supportive of this view. Um, the, but uh, an issue that is really becoming very global now is the issue of privacy standards in digital economy. And it's very clear China has different standards than we, and we have different standards than Europe. And this may have very big consequences for the new technologies, AI, and uh, how are we going to have a trade regime? So my view is we need to have a multilateral discussion. There are still benefits from trade, but a naive view that you know uh, these things don't matter, I think is going to be wrong. Uh, we will have to come to terms with it. I already mentioned the capital markets issue. The con conventional wisdom that everyone benefits from capital market liberalization, the evidence uh, is to the contrary, contri contributes to greater instability. Um, so, and there are questions about the impacts of capital market liberalization of democracy and policy space. I mean, for instance, uh, every time uh, uh, in the first couple, in the first couple elections in, where Lula ran for the presidency of Brazil, uh, every time uh, when he would run, Wall Street would get scared. Uh, they withdraw the money, short-term money from Brazil. The, the Brazilian currency would go down and people would vote against him. So, you know, we, we say we, we, capital market liberalization was as if it was giving uh, a vote to Wall Street. Um, do countries want to do that or not? But certainly it affects the policy space. So there are important research questions of what is the nature of the trade-offs? Is there an optimal degree of openness? What are the best tools for ensuring stability of capital flows? Uh, and there is a, an enormous amount of theoretical and empirical research needed. And the final one has to do with uh, intellectual property. Uh, and here, uh, the conventional wisdom is stronger than intellectual property, the better. Uh, 
the irony, of course, is that most of the globalization agenda is about facilitating cross-border movements of capital, goods, and services. The IPR agenda is about restricting the movement. And um, as I said, it constitutes a transfers from developing countries to developed. Poorly designed IPR regimes may actually lead to less innovation with adverse effects on health and the environment. Now, that seems sort of counterintuitive, but we had a recent experiment uh, that a uh, natural experiment that shows uh, the point I just made. Um, there was a global movement, a global attempt, a research project called uh, the Human Genome Project to decode the human genome. And it was on target to decode the whole thing in a systematic way. But a few American companies figured out that if they could beat the Human Genome Project, by a day, they could get a patent. And if you got a patent on an important gene, you could make a lot of money. And there was a Utah firm, a Salt Lake City firm called Myriad, that got a patent on uh, the BRCA uh, genes, two genes that if you have those genes, you're a woman, you have more than a 50% probability of getting breast cancer. So people were willing to pay a lot of money <laughs> to find out and to take appropriate action. And they charge an enormous amount for that test. And even more important than the fees that they were charging was the data they were collecting on your whole genetic structure. And that, they, they, they viewed that as extraordinarily valuable. Yale uh, figured out a better test and got some civil society groups to say, we'll pay for it for poor people. And Muriel said, no. We want our bad test, and we want our monopoly. And the result is that people died. And uh, one of the things that you know, I'm, I'm proud of is that I joined uh, as the economic witness, uh, uh, expert on a suit to stop this on a suit saying uh, with the uh, um, ACLU that said uh, this, it is not, uh, it should not be possible to patent your genes. You should own your own genes. And uh, it was, you know, it seems obvious, but, but uh, we won in the district court, we lost in the appellate court, and we won in the Supreme Court. Uh, and Justice Kennedy was... Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, after that, we could see what happened. And what happened was prices went down and the tests got much better. It encouraged innovation and encouraged competition. So, it, this illustrates, but there's a lot more research, it illustrates the point that a poorly designed IPR regime can actually impede innovation. So the important research questions are about the appropriate IPR regime for developing countries and emerging markets. Uh, it's different from that appropriate for advanced countries. There are many details uh, uh, that makes it both an interesting and, and complicated uh, question. So let me just conclude. Advances in economics have helped undermine some of the shibboleths that have guided global economic governance and uncovered the need for more research in each of the areas of globalization. But the basic insights on the importance of multilateralism and of an international rule of law remain valid. And this is especially true for developing countries and emerging markets. Uh, and finally, the US now represents, I think, the greatest threat to multilateralism and the international rules-based order. And as citizens, I think we have an important obligation to try to change that. Thank you. It's for uh, not only a very stimulating but entertaining lecture. Uh,
We have a limited amount of time for questions. And one of the hallowed traditions of the Pardee Center is that the first question has to come from a student. So there are microphones. Uh, where are the microphones uh, lined up? Oh, over here and here. So uh, please come up to the microphone with your question, introduce yourself, and make sure it's brief and to the point. OK. Are you a student? I am actually a student. OK. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful talk. I'm a retired emerging markets portfolio manager who's now studying economics. So I'd like to pursue the question of capital flows to developing countries. Uh, many pension funds in the developed world are underfunded. And particularly in an era of low nominal and real interest rates, they're looking for return, as you alluded to. On the other hand, in developing countries, there are massive needs for infrastructure, infrastructure finance. But we've not been able to put to the two together, despite the presence of institutions like MIGA, which you alluded to. I'd just be interested in your thoughts about what mechanisms might be uh, possible to put into place to facilitate those, those flows, which would be win-win for both parties. Yeah, I alluded to that a little bit. I, I, I think uh, the multilateral development banks can play an important role in, you might say, developing the projects and then using, uh, um, you might, I don't, I, structured finance is a bad word these days, but using structured finance, being able to uh, maybe keep a small fraction on the bank's balance sheet, but mostly uh, put it off into uh, uh, different categories of debt. Uh, you know, some safe enough to be put in pension funds and others put off into other kinds of private investment. And so that when I said before that, that when we uh, helped create the New Development Bank, that was part of the idea, that it would uh, find good projects and then create a portfolio and sell off uh, bonds in that portfolio or equity in that portfolio and hopefully attract uh, those kind of portfolio flows. And, and, and it was precisely that there were lots of people who were interested in long-term uh, investments and people who need long-term investment. And we were hoping that, that we, the multilateral development banks could play that intermediation role. Um, and there are a, a number of uh, similar ideas about creating platforms that would do this. But I think the MDBs will, will, are going to play an important role on that. Yes. So I'm a PhD student in political science. Um, well, so I'm also a student. Um, and my research project actually is quite about your first research agenda. So is free trade beneficial for all, right? And I have a hypothesis for this. I think only those who benefit from the free trade would say so, right? And throughout <laughs> the history, <laughs> and then throughout the history, we can see actually those hegemons would actually pro, uh, kind of advocate free trade. So, for example, in the UK, before, when UK was very much of a hegemon, then UK advocate actually for a free trade. And later, US actually was not always the champion for multilateral because before Second World War, US was very much for isolation, right? And federal lease was very much well accepted here in the US. So I think um, I was actually. I, I'm a Chinese, I'm a Chinese student. I was trying to see if actually there is a power transition here between US and China. And China actually, while US is now these days under Trump uh, having this protectionism, right? China is very, actually very much for globalization. Even though the globalization we advocate is a little bit different from Western kind of globalization, but the public opinions and the 
uh, official narratives is very much for globalization. So I'm actually having a hypothesis that, that the, the trade war is a signal for the power transition between China and the US. What do you think? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I think that, uh, as I said, free trade always has had distribution consequences. And uh, that means there are winners and there are losers. And obviously, the winners are the big advocates of it. And uh, the, um, within the developed countries, the, the hegemons, as you call it, um, the, the, the fact that the winners uh, in the corporate sector, for instance, have a lot of influence and have defined the debate. Uh, and that economists made a convincing case that it made the pie bigger. But they didn't explain that just making the pie bigger doesn't make everybody better off. It actually can make some people worse off unless we do something about it. So uh, the, the argument, that, you know, the anti-free trade in the United States, I think, is a result of the fact that we overestimated the overall benefits and we underestimated the distribution benefits and that actually a lot of people were made worse off as a result of free trade. Now, you will hear from some quarters in the United States that most of what has gone on uh, has to do with technical change. We would have had a problem of uh, our industrial heartland, even if there had been no trade, if there had been no globalization. I think that's true. But I think globalization has exacerbated what was all, would have already been a problem. Now, for a developing country, and uh, you know, China uh, has been the most successful of the developing emerging markets, um, the argument against free trade has to do the long-standing argument on what is called the infant industry argument, and I've rewritten that more precisely as the infant economy argument, that you can catch up with the frontier by um, uh, learning by doing, by doing things. Uh, and uh, that you need some protection in the earlier stages of development. So I would say the, the differences are, I mean, related to what you said, but it has to do with the fact that the economics of uh, development are that it becomes almost obvious that you need some protection for a developing countries. Um, and that the uh, United States had tariffs in, in the 19th century. Uh, and uh, Korea succeeded in part because, you know, tariffs by themselves aren't going to solve the problem, but tariffs with other industrial policies do enable you to catch up. And um, if, they had, if Korea had had a f free trade, it would have wound up uh, doing what was its comparative advantage at that point, which was growing rice. And they would have been probably the best rice grower in the world, but they would not have been the industrial might that they are today. So I think the argument for protection is different for developed and developing countries. Okay, gentleman in the middle. Yep. Hi, so uh, despite looks, I also am a student. I just finished my uh, just finished my master's here, and I'm going to be starting in the fall at uh, Northeastern for my PhD. So um, I was wondering if I could convince you to weigh in on uh, the nomination of Richard Moore. Stephen. 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 Yeah. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry Stephen. Yes. Well, I you know I don't know uh, him, so I, you know, and I I. Um, 
Uh, but I don't think any economist knows that. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. And, and that may say something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and it has been, uh, you know, the irony that uh, Peter Diamond, who had a Nobel Prize, could not get through the Republican Senate. And uh, uh, this uh, particular person who uh, uh, doesn't ha ha seemingly have any qualifications <laughs> other than s his support for Trump uh, uh, has been nominated. This is sort of, uh, it's, it's a little bit worrisome too uh, from what one has read. He's, he's uh, uh, when the interest rate, what you know, it's it sort of, it's sort of like Trump. Whatever Obama did was wrong. So whatever was done before, you know, when the interest rates were low, he said they should be high. So in the period of the uh, uh, after the uh, 2008 crisis, I think he was criticizing the low interest rates. Now that we're at full employment, he's criticizing the high interest rates, 2.5% is not that high, but he's criticizing uh, those high interest rates. Um, you know, in a context where, where we have, um, you know, near full employment, I don't think we're at full employment, but near full employment, uh, one of the, probably the largest peacetime deficit that we've ever had um, at this stage, you know, at this close to full employment. Uh, which raises questions about intertemporal distribution, intertemporal equity. So uh, let me mention that now the floor is open for non-students as well. Uh, we have about five minutes left, so really keep it keep it uh, very brief and to the point. Uh, the back. Thank you again for that great uh, discussion and, and lecture. I've read a lot of your work, and it helped to fuel my recent research in Germany, where I spent a few years there actually looking at uh, German law and the impact of social and economic policy change on illegal employment markets. And one of the things that I um, observed is that what's happening now and what you kind of see with the change in politics in Germany is that uh, there has been a backlash against uh, liberalizing policies, and that um, especially sectors like the Handwerk sector, they're actually looking more at uh, humanism as a new type of approach to uh, reverse a lot of the uh, rules around foreign investment and around uh, ways that they've kind of deregulated the labor markets. And it's been very interesting to follow because Germany has a very strong rule of law. How, so. Whenever you're talking about developing countries or countries that don't necessarily have a very strong rule of law or very strong uh, support for regulations, what kind of tools would be available to actually help them protect some of their markets as they're dealing with changes in global trade? Well, yeah, there, there are many parts to your question. I mean, uh, let me say uh, a, a key aspect of uh, uh, economic policy are both the rules that determine the market income and the rules that determine the after disposable income. So you take your market income and, and translate that into what people can consume. Uh, um, Germany did not, uh, in, in what we call the Hartz reforms, Germany did a, a set of reforms that actually undermine workers' bargaining power. They don't have a, until recently, they didn't even have a minimum wage. And they've changed the way labor workers bargain, um, break down, uh, bro uh, broken down sectoral bargaining. The result of that is that Germany uh, has almost as much inequality in market income as the United States. As you know, we're the leader in inequality. We do it better than anyone else. Uh, but Germany is basically not far behind. But Germany does a much better job of uh, redistribution and social protection and health and, and, and lots of other aspects. So, so people in the uh, after tax and uh, transfer, they're a lot more equal a lot more equal than the United States. Not as much as they used to be, but still a lot more equal. 
Um, the, uh, the systems of social protection are really important in enabling countries to absorb the shock of opening up markets. Because when you open up markets, uh, uh, typically what happens is jobs in the import competing sector get destroyed faster than the new jobs in the uh, export sectors get created. So, but even if they were going on at the same pace, people have to move from the old industries to the new. So those are the two things I, I mentioned very briefly. One is active labor market policies to help people move from the old industries to the new. But the second one is industrial policies to make sure that the new industries actually get created. And one of the problems in many countries is uh, a lack of finance for, new, for small and medium-sized enterprises, for new enterprises. So existing enterprises have finance, but if you're, you have new opportunities, you have to be able to have resources to take advantage of those new opportunities. And so uh, that's, those are examples of things that sort of keep in balance the pace of job creation with job destruction. Some of this has to do with the pace of liberalization as well. Uh, you know, if you do things too quickly, and that's one of the things that emerged in developing countries, when you had, you know, big shocks, the systems aren't able to cope. If we do things more gradually, systems are better able to cope with the changes. Okay, I think uh, time for one last question uh, over here. Um, hi, Professor Stiglitz. Thank you for your talk. So I'm an undergraduate at BU studying bioengineering. And your point about um, the Human Genome Project really interested me, interested me as a genetics researcher myself. So now with the emergence of CRISPR-Cas9 systems and directed like um, kind of like designer genetic um, therapies that may be necessary to combat diseases in the future, um, many companies are like looking to patent those and kind of like privatize them. Um, which may put people who need these ther who really need these therapies at risk for like not being able to afford them or have access to them in due time. So what can scientists do to be better advocates for their science and be uh, more active in the policy making and educating society about the necessity of having these technologies open to people? Yeah um, you know, this comes down in part to the advocacy of a balanced intellectual property regime. Now, nobody's advocating getting rid of intellectual property, but it's a question of balance. And you know, in our drug regime, a pharmaceutical regime, it, the Hatch-Waxman Act, which was passed in the 80s, attempted to get a balance between generics, which get, use the market, competitive market forces to get out drugs, uh, quickly, and um, Big Pharma, which does more of the research. And the result of this is that, in fact, more than 80% of the drugs are now generics. And that, uh, without that, prices would be much higher. So one aspect of, of that is, is, in the pharmaceuticals, is trying to advocate for this kind of appropriate balance. In the intellectual property regime, it's, uh, the same issue. Um, uh, there are uh, something I didn't talk about called compulsory licenses, um, where developing countries can get access to life saving drugs. Uh, it's in the WTO in TRIPS. The United States used compulsory license. I mean, people don't. Uh, when after 9 11, there was the anthrax scare. The drug that was the most effective against anthrax is Cipro. And the German company that had the patent on it wasn't able to produce it fast enough. And we just said, it's too bad. We're going to produce it. And you will have to give us a license to produce it. And, and so that was called a compulsory license. Um, but the, there, there is a, a, when I talked about the intellectual property research regime, uh, research agenda, uh, there are quite, lots of questions about 
what can be patented, like natural occurring genes, um, the length and the breadth of the patents. Scientists were overwhelmingly very active in that human gene, in, in, the, in that suit I talked about. Uh, the, 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 the head of the uh, um, NHS, uh, uh, of the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the government lab, research laboratories, uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, was very active in trying to keep, saying you can't patent genes, naturally occurring genes. So the scientists have been very, I mean, active uh, in saying we need a more balanced intellectual property regime and saying that the current intellectual property regime has been driven by corporate interests and is not a balanced regime. And they've been fighting to have a more open architecture that would actually promote more innovation than the current, current regime does. Okay, thank you. Uh, afraid we'll have to bring this to an end. Please join me in thanking Professor Stigler. I'd also like to um, thank the, the people who put in all the, all the hard work to organize this event. Sarah Luttrell, Bill Kring, Re Rebecca Dunn, and Kelly Bankert. Okay, now the, all the hard work is over and there is a reception outside. Please join us. that the future you hope for is shaped by the advice you get and steps you take along the way. Whether you're trying to finance a business, save for upcoming tuitions, or contribute to an IRA, it's never too early or too late to get answers to your retirement questions. Learn more at citizensbank.com slash retirement. Remember, support WBUR now, and you could win a 2019 Lexus UX Hybrid all-wheel drive crossover courtesy of the Boston area Lexus dealers. Give now at WBUR.org, and thanks. In the forecast, we'll see scattered showers tonight, but it'll be warmer tomorrow. Here's WBUR meteorologist Dave Epstein. A couple of light showers this evening, otherwise just clouds overnight, down to the lower 40s. Tomorrow, it will start murky and end up partly sunny. Temperatures get to between 60 and 65 in many locations, even a few upper 60s southwestern suburbs. Look for gusty southerly wind in the afternoon. For Sunday, a few showers around the area. Temperatures in the morning will be rising to the upper 50s, but they fall to the low 50s, and eventually it gets fairly chilly Sunday night.